Good evening, dear friends. It's almost six o'clock, but I also know that it's dinner time and people getting home from work and all that. So for our last class, we started about five minutes in. So if you'd like to get some water or tea, maybe a notebook, you're welcome to do so. You're welcome to say hello in the chat. I posted a link in the chat for our Heal the Planet Day, Earth Day celebration that's coming up. It's a little registration form for it. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we start officially. But you can click on it and check out on our Earth Day celebration if you're local in uh, South Florida. It's going to be great. It's on April 25th, I believe. Um, but yeah, we'll start in just a second. So I will see you soon. <laughs> Mute. Mute. Um, <laughs> I said I saw that Noelia is on the call. Noelia is our executive director for Heal the Planet. She's putting together the Heal the Planet Earth Day celebration and she wrote um, yes, April 25th is our event. And Noelia, if you want, you can say hi to everybody and you can say a word on Heal the Planet Day too. She's Hello, everyone. Thank you, Megan. Such a pleasure to be with all of you. I'm so excited for today's workshop. I know Megan is going to do an amazing job. And yes, we would love to have you in our uh, event. It will be on April 25th. And if you would like to register, you have a chance to win $150 or $250. Um, it's a raffle that we're going to be doing. Just, you know, it's a free event if you register. Simple as that, you can join us. It will be lovely. We're going to have activities for adults and kids. So I can't wait to, to see you there. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, we were so excited for our Earth Day celebration last year and as we know April 25th was about a month into when everything really changed and so we weren't able to have it but I think this is our seventh or eighth sixth or seventh uh Heal the Planet Day and we usually do it around Earth Day and it's really fun so we hope that we'll see you there so um we'll get started in about two minutes but I would love to hear from you guys in the ch chat as to why you on this Wednesday night of your life decided to come to a workshop on soil because the truth is, is most people, soil is not the most exciting subject to many. Um, I think plants are becoming more interesting to people and intriguing, but soil is kind of like, what? what's going on with soil? Um, so I would love to hear in the chat, uh, maybe why you're here and how you heard about the event too, if you saw it on, our marketing medium or however you are and maybe where you're from as well too because a cool thing about these online workshops is not everybody is gathering from south florida i know i got my friend garrett to my right in the brady bunch and garrett is a master gardener here in south florida um but i don't recognize some other names in here so i would love to hear where you're from and 
Um, Margate, nice, love to hear it. So she's not too far away. So we would love to see you at Heal the Planet Day if you'd like to be there. And yeah, I'm really excited for what we're gonna talk about tonight. We keep our, our workshop to just an hour because I know we all are at a Zoom capacity of about here. But my hope is that you receive some useful information tonight. I'm gonna to share my screen. So I'm gonna um, show some, some photos from a little slideshow I created years ago for the first class I taught on soil and I was just kind of flicking through it. Rick, you looked familiar to me. I was gonna say, Rick, were you there? So Rick joined us for our Heal the Planet nature tour last Saturday, which was an unprecedented nature tour because um, we showed up at the park that we usually do our nature tour at, but it had recently been turned into a vaccination site. Park manager said it was gonna be okay, but we got there and National Guard says, I don't think so, no nature tour today. So we thought fast and everybody ended up coming up to my house and we did a little tour of my food forest garden. And Rick, something cool you'll get to see since you saw it in its, its full form right now um, is you'll see some pictures of when it first began. So that's cool. And hopefully we'll give you a little bit of inspiration. Can, so can, six, I, say, six, can I say something too? Yes. So I have a green machine composting bin, which I've been using. It's been like a bottomless pit. <laughs> I just throw um, green material in there and never get anything out. So I recently started mixing it with black soil, like top flat dirt and mixing it in. And so now it's a lot better, I think. And I was inspired at your house to compost a little bit more. And I threw a bunch of my um, compost under my mango tree. And I want it to look like your oak tree. <laughs> well, I like and, you know, I've learned to do it a little bit better than I've been doing, so. Well, I love to hear that. I'm unfamiliar with the green machine model. So you're only throwing food scraps in, you're not throwing in any brown matter? Yeah, I don't have a lot of brown matter in my yard. Um, I have some leaves, I've red tip cocoa plums that shed a little bit. I did find, I did see after you inspired me Saturday, I saw the, um, the maintenance people in our community had a big bucket full of leaves from oak trees, but I wasn't able to stop them and get there in time. Was... Yeah, it's amazing. You'll see, especially around this time of year when the oaks are dropping their leaves. My family lives in New Orleans and like, it's crazy how many bags out of the street. You can just get like a perfect clean bag of leaves. You can just pick that up. Yeah. Um, but here, yeah, it's, it's, you have to just start noticing, you know, and noticing when the tree trimmers on your street um, and starting to get in that mindset. So after this Saturday, it sounds like it's been what, three days and you're already on it, Rick. So I love to hear it. <laughs> so you'll get some more yeah. tips tonight. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, awesome, love to see it, Garrett. Welcome Karina from the Kind Garden. I've been wanting to visit the Kind Garden, so hopefully you can give us a tour there sometime soon. But I'm going to introduce myself before I share my screen. So hello everybody, my name is Megan. Um, I'm Heal the Planet's Whole Systems Educator. This is our second online workshop and we're excited to be offering this because we've been doing workshops in person now uh, for a little over a year but to be able to reach everybody in different places is pretty nice and so I'm grateful for you all being here and I always like to preface before I begin a talk that I grew up in the urban environment um, I didn't grow up in a very, I grew up here in South Florida, so I didn't have a very wild farm upbringing. I wasn't exposed to this stuff. And the reason I share this is because I hope you, you feel that you can do this too. If I can do it, you can do it. Because I, for much of my life, was very unaware of regenerative systems, permaculture, which we're going to talk about tonight, and soil in and of itself. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about soil tonight and the importance of soil and how we can build soil on our site using regenerative methods. So, um, the word regenerative, if I could define it in a hand gesture is kind of this, this, it's this circular loop with the hands. Um, there's a lot of talk in the environmental movements around sustainability and it's great that we're even starting to think about those things, but 
sustainability is kind of this flat line where we're keeping things the same. Thinking of it through the lens of soil, it could be the lawn crew coming through, blowing up those leaves um, and getting rid of them, putting them in the plastic bag. Um, it's keeping things the same. So what we want to do is start to tap into this feedback loop. Um, I believe we talked about it last month, but it's hard to say with the classes that I teach. So I'll say it again. Um, essentially, it goes, one of the permaculture patterns that we love to follow is the mother pattern. And the mother pattern is based off of the shape of a tree. So if we think about a tree, Rick was at my house, he knows um, that the oak is now in bloom and dropping its leaves abundantly um, onto my space. And so what usually happens in the urban environment is like I said, the leaves get blown up, they get taken off to the landfill and they aren't able to complete that cycle feeding back into the base of the oak tree, creating life and habitat for fungi, bacteria, anoles, um, all the life that you have underneath the oak tree, um, feeding that life back in, going back into the tree, and it's that circular loop. And so that's really a, just a guiding principle moving forward to have a better understanding of what permaculture is and how we can build soil regeneratively. Um, so let's share that screen. Here we go. Microsoft PowerPoint, there it is. All right, can everybody see it? Garrett, I see you. Garrett's, Garrett's giving me the nod, okay. Um, so I'm not gonna see you anymore for a second. So here I go. So play from the start. Okay, so we're not going to talk specifically around Florida soil because I know some of you said that you are from Florida, but I know that other people are from other places. But no matter where you're from, I'm sure if you've told people that you're trying to grow things, if you're in Florida, we'll use our example because that's where we're based. Um, people say, whoa, we got sandy soil. Why are you trying to, we, got, we don't have good soil here. Um, but the reason the soil is not so good is because we are making it that way by blowing up those leaves, getting rid of it. Sure, in the tropics, things break down very quickly and we don't have that dormant resting period like in temperate regions. Um, but we can definitely build soil here. Rick, you probably remember when you were walking in the food forest where I am, it was nice and squishy. And so, yes. I, <laughs> yes. So uh, my front lawn, I was going to post a picture of it. I was going to put it in the slideshow, but I didn't have time to. Um, but my front area was just a grass lawn to begin with. I believe we have some, uh, a photo. No. We'll get there. Sorry. Sorry for going so fast. Um, but it was just a classic grass lawn. Like you see everywhere, grass. That's it getting mowed week after week. Um, so one of the first things you wanna start doing when you get to a site is building soil. So a lot of times when we think of getting started gardening, we're like, man, I can't wait to plant these fruit trees and um, these, this vegetable garden and all that. But I always think of my boss, John, at the Urban Farming Institute, and he would say, we don't feed the plants, we feed the soil. So a lot of times we're focused on feeding that plant, but how can we create a healthy soil system for the plant to live in? Because essentially that's the plant's foundation. Of course, things can affect the plant, but when you have a healthy, strong soil system, it's kind of like the human body where it's like, if we have a healthy, strong gut, we are much better able to handle what comes in, be it coronavirus or going on a trip on an airplane. Why is it that some people go on the airplane and they get sick and other people don't? And a huge part of that is our mycorrhizal network in our guts. And so just reflecting that back to the soil, that's our guiding force. So how can we start to build up that life in the soil? It's like taking a probiotic or eating some kimchi or doing something like that. And there's all sorts of different strategies wherever you are um, that will translate into the methods that I'm gonna share with you tonight. So what we're looking at right now is a bunch of cosmos and bananas. That was a site I worked on on the big island. Um, so long story short, Florida's got some sandy soil. So this is um, 
we're not going to go into soil science either because honestly i'm not a soil scientist and i think it turns people off in a lot of ways um, when you get too in the weeds with these things essentially what you need to think about is stacking things layering things kind of like lasagna layering it's important to know your bedrock and useful to know that um, we have a limestone bedrock in my region so that's why we have a very sandy soil and that gives you a better understanding of um, what would be the basic mineral component in your soil like clay or sand um, and then you have a better idea of what to do but for the most part your general guideline is going to be lasagna layering it up a lot of times there's this idea that we need to till the soil um, but that takes a lot of energy and is not always the best method in truth. Um, one, because we're disturbing the mycorrhizal network. Um, it's kind of like going in there and raking through your gut, you know, it doesn't really feel the best. Sometimes it will move things around, but we're also, if we're worried about weeds and things like that, where we should do a whole workshop on weeds. I'm thinking about that right now. Noelle and I were talking about our workshops coming up. So if you're interested in learning about weeds, let me know. Um, but you're, if you're trying to suppress weeds and you're tilling the soil, think about it, you're exposing that weed, that weed seed to the sunlight and that's going to grow. So then you're gonna have to deal with it, but weeds aren't such a bad thing. So maybe we can do a workshop on that. Wow. This is a gorgeous slide of life in the soil. Um, so essentially what we're trying to do is create healthy life in the soil of uh, worms, bacteria, all sorts of things that we mo mainly can't even really see. We're gonna talk about vermicomposting with worms, um, but there's all sorts of different forms, life forms in the soil. And the top three stars that we have on here are nematodes, which aren't always seen as such a good thing. But um, I remember when I was creating this slideshow years ago, I learned some really amazing facts about nematodes that I have here, they represent 90% of animals on the ocean floor. Um, and the majority of them, long story short, are not such a bad thing. Many of them are actually beneficial to the soil. Um, but if you do have nematodes and you're in our region, you're struggling with that, sargassum seaweed, I found can be very helpful for kneeweeds, um, nematodes, <laughs> kneeweeds. Um, but you can suppress them. They, for some reason, don't like the sargassum seaweed. So you can gather that at the beach. And we also have access to that in Cider Park. I see that some people are writing in the chat, but I'm gonna keep rolling and then we'll answer questions at the end. I get, I get so excited um, and then I trail off and then we go past an hour. How are we doing on time? We're doing well. Um, so yeah, uh, and then fungi and bacteria besides nematodes are what's the main foundation of our soil. And I always think of, I, I teach kids classes and I always had this memory of one of the kids in the class, I was talking about bacteria in the soil. And this was years ago before even um, sanitation and things like that. And I told him that there was bacteria in the soil and he was like, oh. I remember him just looking so shocked and he was so worried that he was gonna get sick from the bacteria in the soil. But bacteria is a very good thing. Bacteria is all over us and all around us, all inside of us and in the soil as well too. Um, so how can we support that bacteria? How can we get more of it going on so that we create this really strong network? Let's find out. Um, oh, so this is just a slide of like a little simple test that you can do. You don't necessarily have to send in a soil sample. I have never done a soil sample on my land, one, because I think I would be probably pretty terrified because in the urban environment, there's a lot of toxicity in the soil. Um, but two, also because I know I got a lot of sand going on. So what you can do is you can dig up some soil from your, your land. You can do it in different spots around your site as well, too and you'll put it into a clear jar, fill it with some water, let it settle, and you can see the different layers based off of the density of the mineral particles. So sand would be at the bottom, then silt, and then clay. That's just a nice photo of a site from the Big Island. All right, so let's dive into it. So most regenerative and organic agriculture is rebuilding life in the soil. So that way we don't have to rely on outside sources for our fertilizer. 
Um, we're going to learn about some plants that grow well in our bioregion that you can use as living plant food. And I encourage you to, when we get to that area after this, if you're excited about this, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to present you with some different soil building strategies. So don't feel like you have to do all of this. I will share before my nature tour that I, I share a lot of information, but whatever is most exciting to you will stick with you. Whatever is supposed to stick with you tonight will stick with you. So just open yourself up. Don't try and remember it all. Um, and whatever you're like, wow, yeah, I want to start learning about ground covers and growing some ground covers on my land, then that's the lead to follow. So, um, yeah, let's dive into ground covers since they're right before us. So ground covers are things that cover the ground. And there are different, different plants that we can grow for different purposes. Um, and they're essentially known as cover crops. So what we see in this photo was when I first started on my site, I was growing a lot of sweet potato. This was before I really had a lot of iguana pressure. I, re I think Rick asked me a question about iguanas when we were um, together. So every mm -hmm. place has, <laughs> yeah, so every place has a, a challenge and ours is iguanas and they love to eat sweet potato leaves. Um, but I got some great sweet potato harvest and sweet potatoes are a vining ground cover so that little heart-shaped leaf that you can see, that is a sweet potato. So we're stacking functions here, uh, which means that we're obtaining many yields from one plant. So the sweet potato is growing a nice calorie crop underground, and it's also covering the ground, which helps um, the ground to be less exposed to the elements. So think about that forest floor where um, leaves are falling down and it's a nice, rich kind of dappled light environment where bacteria and fungi and life can grow. So that's what we're trying to simulate through these ground covers. It's kind of like a little mini forest. Think of yourself as a tiny creature beneath that sweet potato leaf. Um, so maybe I should mute everyone's mics. I don't want to do that, but give me one second. Is everybody muted? I, I feel like I'm hearing some background noises. If you can, and you're here right now, please mute your mic so that way it's not, um, so other people don't hear. And then we will open up to discussion at the end. Um, so yeah, ground covers are covering the ground and there's lots of options. So sweet potato provides us with a calorie crop, something to eat. You can also eat sweet potato leaves. Um, but also at the same time, there are a lot of ground covers. Ideally, we're growing nitrogen fixing ground covers as well. So some nitrogen fixing ground covers that grow well in our bioregion are uh, perennial peanut, sunshine mimosa is a Florida native. And these ground covers will start to spread very quickly across the ground. And nitrogen is what most soil is missing. So when we go to the store and we buy fertilizer, we're buying sort of an NPK blend and nitrogen is what that N is. So um, that nitrogen fixing ground cover is gonna feed the plants as well as create that nice ground cover environment, suppress weeds at the same time, and also look gorgeous. Perennial peanut has these cute little uh, yellow flowers that you can eat that taste like peanuts. It's a legume. A lot of our nitrogen fixers are in that family. Um, Sunshine Mimosa has a cute little pink puff ball that in traditional Chinese medicine is used to promote happiness in the body. Um, but just if you're interested in ground covers for your place, um, what you would look up online is you would type in ground covers. Sometimes typing in the word permaculture can help too because then you'll find some really good stuff. So you could write permaculture, ground covers for zone, whatever you are. So I'm zone 10B where I am. So typing in, if you know, so what a zone is, it's the Köppen climate scale. And you can look up, say you don't know your zone. That's the, that's the first thing to Google before that. So you would type in, um, what is the hardiness zone for Maryland or wherever the place was? and then look for nitrogen fixing ground covers for your place or calorie crops like sweet potato. Um, some other ideas, just throwing them out, are like clover, alfalfa, radishes are a good one too. They um, help 
decompact compacted soils, um, peas, oats, buckwheat, the list goes on forever. I won't list them all. But you can just look those things up and start your food forest floor. Um, let's keep moving. All right, mulch, my favorite topic. Uh, I wish it was still light outside, but I'm excited because I think next month I won't have to have these bright lights on and maybe we can do our workshop from my garden. Um, but last time it was dark like an hour before, so we're getting closer towards spring. But I was gonna show you my mulch, my little mulch mountain outside in my driveway, but this, what we're seeing right here was my first mulch mountain I ever had dropped on my site to the right. To the left is a mulch queen. Her name is Corrine. She's who I did my permaculture design certification with years ago. And I remember when I pulled up to the site, I didn't have such an appreciation for mulch as I do now. And I was like, whoa, what's with all this mulch? What's going on? Needless to say, she was just starting her site. She calls herself a pioneer species, which is essentially like a, a plant that blows into a place and gets the forest started. So she had just moved to this place. So you can see that um, it was just like a pasture field, but she was having local uh, tree trimmers drop off loads of hardwood mulch to start building soil on her site. And now I am fully converted to love mulch forever. And I hope that you leave this call tonight with a deep love of mulch in your heart. So mulch is just another word for um, wood chips, um, broken down plant matter. And the amazing thing about mulch is that it's like the fast track process of a forest. So you think about a tree decomposing to mulch status, that takes a long time. So the fact that we have this as a resource in our community is something we really should be tapping into more because our tree trimmers, they have to pay to drop off mulch at um, the landfill where it mixes with all of our other items that we've thrown away and creates a big methane mess essentially. And if we could harness that energy, we would start building soil. And this would help us specifically in our bioregion. I was just on a 4-H call with a bunch of kids earlier today and we were talking about permaculture and we were talking about catching and storing energy, the energy of water in our place. In our coastal community, my grandma, who I live next door to, her house flooded four times this last year. She's lived in that house for 50 years and it's never happened. And the reason this is happening is because we don't have soil. We don't have places for the water to go. The water is pitched towards the storm drain, but when the storm drain is full, there's nowhere for it to go. And so because we have so many concrete surfaces, we're not able to catch and store the energy of that water. And so if we were to divert some mulch from the landfill and start building soil, um, we wouldn't be in such a challenging place. So I remember I spoke on a call a couple of weeks ago with the UFIFAS um, head, Lorna, Lorna Bravo, and she was saying that our first line of defense is our front yard. And it doesn't have to be a line of defense, but it is a place where we can take action. It's a place where we can make a difference. It's a place where we can create the more beautiful world that our heart knows possible and create a little oasis for ourselves. And the way we start is through mulch. And how you get access to mulch is by just starting to call upon the mulch gods. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but truly, it's just starting to put your feelers out for mulch. Um, so this could be noticing, like I said, when you got a tree trimmer on your street, when you hear that chipper in the distance when you're at your house and you're like, man, that's pretty annoying. Turn it around, go on over and connect with those tree trimmers and say, hey, what are you chipping? Ideally, what we're looking for is a clean load of hardwood mulch. That's what you'll say to the tree trimmer. I'm looking for a clean load of hardwood mulch. Um, and this, like the load that was just dropped at my house was a blend of oak, mahogany, and royal point sienna, which is great because royal point sienna is a nitrogen fixing tree. So when I heard that, I got so excited. Um, something we deflect often in our environment is mulch with palm in it but palm provides phosphorus, a significant amount of phosphorus and potassium to the system. So 
the, the palm mulch is the most aesthetically pleasing. However, if you do have an excess of palms at your home, you can lay a layer down of palms, which would be great for suppressing weeds, and then put some nice hardwood mulch on top of that. And it's essentially like you're creating your nice little smother layer with some palm. Um, yeah, so ideally our mulch is made up of hardwoods. I feel like I'm just in a slideshow world right now and I don't know what's going on with you guys. I'm gonna check the chat and see if anybody has any questions. Will the slides be emailed after? I would love to email you the slides after. So I'll share my information um, at the end of this. So you'll have my email. We're also recording this as well too. Um, just so you know, I should have said that at the beginning of the call. Nobody's really sharing their screen. Garrett, you'll be a superstar, we'll see you. Um, but if you're, oh, there he goes. <laughs> so if you don't want to be recorded, you can hide yourself. Um, but does anybody have any questions while I'm looking at the chat? You're welcome to ask one. Because um, I know sometimes questions will pass you by and you're like, well. And don't be shy on any questions, honestly. I, as I mentioned, I'm not a soil scientist by any means. So thank you for being here for this talk on soil. Um, but no question is a... A bad question because the truth is is soil is something that is not really discussed at all. I did not learn about soil at all while I was in school and it's a very important uh, system on our earth. All right, I don't see any questions so let's keep rolling. All right, everyone sees the slideshow again, we're good. All right, so here is a Rick, this is for you. Um, so this whole space was grass before, uh, and this was probably a couple months after I had moved in, I would say. Um, so I mulched the ground and I started to just plant things. So what you can see, Rick, if you remember walking beneath that moringa tree, there it is, the old skinny one to the left. Garrett, I know you're growing moringa right now. I hope that it's going well. Um, but you'll also see some support species in the photo as well, too. So we're going to talk about support species soon. Support species are those living plant foods, um, our living fertilizer that we can chop and drop back to feed other plants. So in the middle of the food forest is Mexican uh, sunflower, Tithonia diversifolia, which I ended up moving to the edge because it got quite big. A lot of our mineral accumulators will grow very quickly those tiny little sprouts in the front, framing the croton, the plant with the psychedelic looking leaves. Those little sprouts are comfrey, which is another mineral accumulator. And then back behind the croton tomato, um, looking back is a pigeon pea back there, which is an excellent nitrogen fixing and delicious plant. All right, sheet mulching. Let me take a sip of water. Okay, so you want to start a garden bed. You think you need to go to Home Depot and buy a cedar box. You got to buy the soil. No, you don't have to do any of that. Here is what you do. So I did a little experiment when I moved in. As you can see, Grass City that I was living in. Um, so I did an experiment first where I did solarization. So to the left, you'll see some charred grass. Solarization is a excellent practice for um, solarizing, essentially burning to a crisp diseased plants. But I would not recommend this for the future because we're also charring life, bacterial life. Um, but I didn't know if I would be able to just lay the cardboard down and start from there. However, the garden that I built after that, I did the experiment without it. Totally fine, no grass pressure at all, worked great. So disregard the first corner and where we'll begin is with cardboard boxes. So maybe you order things online. Even if you don't order things online, we are swimming in cardboard boxes at this time. So if you do order things online, you can just save those boxes. Um, and if you don't, you can go to your local grocery store um, and get some boxes. They have them nice and broken down behind. 
So you'll accumulate your cardboard boxes, you'll flatten them out. Ideally, we're looking for some brown cardboard boxes like that, not, not the ones that are kind of like glossy. And we'll lay down the shape of our garden bed. The shape that you're seeing on the right is called a keyhole bed. And I like this shape because you're able to go into that um, little pocket right there and access all the different points of the bed. So we wouldn't want it to just be a big square like on the left, because if we did, we wouldn't be able to reach the center of the bed. So the keyhole bed, we're able to go into the center and we can touch all the different points. One of the permaculture slogans you'll hear about it is, um, it's kind of this do nothing gardening thing, least amount of energy for the greatest amount of yield. And that's great, you know, we don't wanna to have to be doing a lot of work. Instead, we want the system to be um, as self-sufficient as possible. And when we're out there gardening, we don't have to walk around the perimeter of the bed. We wanna just go in the center. So we lay out our shape, we lay down our cardboard boxes. And as you can see, there's a little hose there getting the cardboard boxes wet. So there's two methods for getting it wet. You'll find that the cardboard boxes definitely have a knack for deflecting water. Um, I see some questions in the chat and it was a very good question, Karina. We're gonna get back to that in just a second. Um, I'll answer the questions all together at the end. I shouldn't have trailed off because I know we are even, it's crazy how quickly an hour will go by. Um, okay, so we got the shape of the bed and we're getting them wet. So you can put the hose on like that or you can also just make a little bathtub and put the boxes in it and just let them soak. Either way, we wanna get that cardboard nice and wet. And you'll know if you've left cardboard outside, life in the soil really likes cardboard. Um, you'll find earthworms and centipedes and millipedes underneath it almost instantly when you leave it outside and it gets wet. So this smother layer is returning those trees that the cardboard was back to the soil. It's suppressing weeds and it's also attracting life. Next move. Second, there we go. Okay, so I framed the keyhole bed then with whatever I had around. So you can you can buy wood from the store or I found these half bricks on the side. So I used those half bricks. Uh, and then also I ran out of half bricks, you can see. So I did some firewood in the center that was also lying around. You can use logs as well too. They were cutting down a coconut palm at my neighbor's house the other day and I lined my tomato patch with the coconut palm and that was so nice. Um, but creating an edge is nice, aesthetically pleasing, but not even 100% necessary. It helps contain that energy though, especially when the bed is just getting established. So I framed the bed and then I filmed it, and then I filled it with our favorite item, mulch. So mulch is our carbon matter. We're gonna talk about this in, more in the composting section, but Ideally, what we're layering in our sheet mulch layers is a blend of carbon and nitrogen matter. That's what our compost pile is as well, too. So these are just two big words for our brown and our green matter, our dead stuff and our um, life filled stuff, kind of like our food scraps or green grass trimmings. So we lay in a thick layer of mulch, probably about a foot high, it looks like it is there. Then I covered it with my first batch of compost. Um, so there it is, nice and dark. We don't wanna leave it though, so exposed to the sunlight. And also when you're adding your layers in, you wanna wet between each layer. So getting that mulch nice and wet, then getting that compost nice and wet. And then I did another layer of mulch on top and then it was time to plant. So these beds will get better year after year. The most challenging year will be the first year. So I recommend using starters. Um, you can start these in your nursery or you can get them from a local nursery that has some good um, starters to get started with. <laughs> starters to get started with. Um, but because the, the system's not that built up yet with life, it's hard to start seeds just directly in the in the beds themselves. Um, and so when you put your starter in, you're also gonna wanna create like a little tiny container of um, 
of soil around it. So you can use, like I use my compost around the plant itself because as the plant is sending out its roots, it's gonna want some fertility and life to move into. Um, or you could, if you aren't composting at the time, you could go to a local store or to a local, like in Davie, out in Davie, you can pick up manure. Um, that would be from a local horse stable, it could be chicken manure, something around it to build life and fertility, but you can also just buy a topsoil to get started. But year after year, the system will just get better and better. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about next are things that you can add to the, the bed to make it stronger. Um, like biochar would be a thing that I, I remember adding into this bed later on. Whoa, there's some tomatoes. Looking good. Um, okay, so here's some other shapes of uh, sheet mulch beds. So as I said, you don't even have to have a framed edge. This was at the site where I did my permaculture design. Um, this is kind of like a U-shaped. These were some at a site in Mississippi that I worked at. You can really do whatever you want. Just get creative, have fun with it. Um, so yeah, I'll keep going because I know we're getting, we got a lot more to cover and we don't have that much time. But if you have questions on that, we will touch on that soon. Slideshow, play from current slide. All right, composting. So we might just do a workshop specifically on composting because there's so much to talk about on composting. Um, but if you want to get started today, I would recommend doing so. And um, because a lot of us are creating, we're creating this food waste all the time. And when you start to become aware of waste is just a resource out of place, we start to want to tap into that energy and use that energy to um, build life in our garden. So compost is essentially like a probiotic for the soil. So it's not providing that nitrogen or potassium or phosphorus, it's instead adding good bacteria. Um, so I mentioned carbon and nitrogen before and carbon and nitrogen are what we need to layer into our composting system. So as Rick knows, he was at my house the other day, my preferred method for composting is just a pile system like you see here before you. A lot of times when people start composting, they think they need to buy a compost tumbler or something like that to try and contain the energy of it because there's this fear of pests or smell or flies or whatever it is. Um, but if we're composting correctly, we're not going to have that issue. And the way we're composting correctly is by layering our browns and our greens. So our browns, my preferred brown is mulch, um, but brown is just dead matter. So that could be, I have the oak leaves I've been using lately. Um, it could be straw or hay. That's one that's used a lot in temperate regions. Um, See what I got on my list, pine needles. Pine needles are um, pretty acidic though, but that can be useful if you're growing uh, blueberries. Um, dead grass is one. So while the grass is green and after, right after you trim it, that's providing nitrogen, but as it turns brown, that's carbon. Um, palm fronds, we mentioned before, not everybody's favorite, but definitely a brown that's in abundance where we are, coconut coir any dead stuff on site. We wanna be mindful of using diseased plants in our compost pile. So that's where the solarization can come in. And um, that would be, we're able to create kind of a quarantine spot for sick plants, cover those plants up with um, um, a tarp and put it in the sun and just wait a little while for it to become crispy and that kills any um, disease or disease items, but we don't want to put any diseased plants in our compost pile. And then our green matter, what everybody thinks of when they think of composting is our kitchen scraps. So a lot of times people will buy the compost tumbler and they'll just put in um, kitchen scraps and they'll say, whoa, this turned into a gross smelly mess with a crazy liquid coming out of it. What's going on? Composting's not for me. Um, but that's because the brown matter was missing. Um, so when we, when we make a deposit of our kitchen scraps, we want to cover it up with our brown matter. 
other green items that could go into the compost pile would be um, green grass clippings or green leaves, healthy pulled up plants that are still green, um, charged biochar, which we'll talk about in a second. And we'll also talk about urine and manure in a second too. We're gonna close on urine, that urine note that is so fun to close on, but it's a really amazing source of fertility that we often overlook our own waste stream because it's kind of weird to look at, um, but is an, an amazing source of life for a regenerative system. We don't necessarily have to pee on your compost pile. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's ideal, ideally this balance of green and brown matter where we're covering up our green matter with brown matter. We wanna cover it up so much that we're creating this little shield. You can't see any of the green matter anymore. And that creates a biofilm is what it's called. And the biofilm makes it so that nature um, is less keen to it. Um, but I think about the drifting raccoon or possum in the night who comes to the pile and like finds some bones in it or <laughs> whatever it is. And they're excited, you know, they're a little scrapper in the night. So you will have an occasional drifter move through, but it's nothing really to worry about. And think of it as them turning your compost pile as well too for you. I never turn my compost pile. So another thing too, is you don't have to turn compost. You can just do this lasagna layering system. Turning the compost pile essentially just breaks things down faster. Um, but like we said, least amount of energy for greatest amount of yield. So I just bring my food scraps out, layer it, and I do a two pile system. So I move from side to side. So that way I have one active pile at a time and one passive pile at a time. Um, the active pile is the one that we're actively contributing to. And the passive pile is the pile that is just hanging out and breaking down. And then usually around the time the active pile is like a leaning tower, that's when I'll move to the passive pile, harvest that, and then start um, composting on that side. So I'm just kind of moving back and forth. But if you would like to learn more about composting, we filmed a composting series for Heal the Planet with like some short, easy videos from my garden. So you'll see my little compost pile. And we're gonna talk about vermicomposting in a second. And if you're interested and wanna learn more, um, let us know and we'll do a composting workshop for our spring series where we can go a little bit more in depth. So here's just some models of compost. So it can literally just be a pile like that or you can get fancy with it. So this was one of the first things I ever built with a drill. I felt very proud of it. Um, these were pallets I had found <laughs> on the side of the road. Um, and you can frame out your two piles with the pallets and you can paint them and make it nice. Here's a three pile system. So that's just essentially having one more resting side, depending on how much you're inputting, how big your family is, um, how much is going on with the compost pile. So once we have our compost, we can turn it into compost tea, uh, which is essentially like a bacteria brew uh, that adds good bacteria to the soil. Um, this little recipe you see on the left was the recipe that was used at that farm where I did my PDC. Um, and it's done through aeration. So you're letting it sit for usually a couple of days and you can add in all sorts of good things to it. At the Urban Farming Institute, John makes a uh, bacteria brew every Saturday for the gardeners there. And he primarily focuses on worm castings even more than compost. Um, wow, it's already 6.50. So I'm gonna keep moving. Oh, there's my oak tree. So there's the two pile system. You can see the left side is kind of piled high, right side looks pretty broken down. And then that little container right there is a little container of mulch. I mentioned that my aunt composts um, with me. And so I, I make it easy. And it's also just nice sometimes when you go out in the night and you don't wanna look for some brown matter. So make a little pile next to it and just replenish that pile from time to time. Uh, another way to build soil is through hugel culture. Hugel culture is essentially using larger brown matter, which is like our logs, our twigs, and we're creating beds um, 
like this. So you can dig out a hole or you can create a large mound. Um, and essentially what's happening is, is the, the um, wood and twigs are breaking down. And it's also creating this kind of like cave system for um, roots to move through. Um, and yeah, this is a good option for storing water as well too. It's a very low watering system. Dynamic accumulators. So these are those living plant foods that I was uh, mentioning before. So they're, they're different. Take one more sip of water. They're different in every place. So what you see on the left is comfrey. I believe comfrey grows in temperate regions as well too. Um, so it grows from Hawaii to temperate regions. Comfrey has a deep tap root, so it's able to pull up minerals from the soil and you can use its leaves to um, add fertility to your soil. On the right, you've got Mexican sunflower with those little yellow blooms. And that provides a significant dose of phosphorus to the system. And essentially what we're doing with these dynamic accumulators is we're letting them grow, we're chopping them back, and then we're putting that plant matter at the base of things that we want to feed. So say we got a fruit tree that we wanna feed, uh, we'll chop back our Mexican sunflower. We'll put that at the base of our fruit tree, kind of creating a donut ring around it. And then we'll cover that matter with some mulch to kind of seal it in. And that's gonna provide some nice phosphorus to whoever got it. Another great um, dynamic accumulator, some nitrogen fixing plants are pigeon peas I mentioned before. Man, I should have done a little show and tell for that for that one I did the other day. My screen wasn't working, and I had I had harvested some plants from my garden. But pigeon peas right now are fruiting. If you've ever been to a Caribbean restaurant here, you've had probably peas and rice, and those peas are pigeon peas, and they are a legume that fixes nitrogen in the soil. So nitrogen is a um, molecule in the air that these plants have a special ability. They have a symbiotic relationship with a bacteria called rhizobium. So they take the um, nitrogen from the air and they store it in these root nodes and it slowly feeds the plants around them. And it also, when you chop the plant back, um, it releases nitrogen into the soil and its leaves hold nitrogen as well too. So once again, taking those leaves, putting them around the base of the tree, covering it with some mulch, and then you got your nitrogen. So if you're interested in these dynamic accumulators, there are many of them. Look up once again, um, permaculture, food forest system, dynamic accumulators, or nitrogen fixing plants for zone 10B, or zone wherever you are. And you will find more, um, more sources for that. This is uh, that site I worked at on the Big Island. And you can see that the garden beds are edged with comfrey. So that closest um, bed to you has comfrey along the edge. And um, this not only is building soil around the bed and suppressing weeds, but also you can just easily pull off a leaf and put it on the, the plants around in the beds. Wow, this is a pretty cool picture, remineralization. So. Um, this is what happens in the, in the living world. A, a being will die and bones provide a significant amount of nutrition. If you've been to a garden store, you've heard, you've seen bone meal or blood meal and things like that. Um, and this just happens in the living world. So allowing that process to play out is wonderful. And there's other ways we can access minerals as well too. Um, here in our coastal community, we have access to a lot of shells, which provides calcium to the soil. Um, bones provide phosphorus. Uh, you can buy things at the store, but I, I really encourage you to look to what you already have around you. Um, like we have sargassum seaweed on our beach, so you could buy kelp from the store, but you could use that seaweed as well. Um, yeah. And humanure and urine. So we'll just <laughs> touch briefly on this. Um, so composting toilets are really wonderful, but if you live in the city, that's not always an option. So one way that you can 
store the energy of urine is um, through charging biochar. So if you have a fire, before the fire goes out, extinguish the coals. As you can see here, it's kind of like that phase where it's nice and glowy. You'll extinguish it with some water. Next morning, you'll wake up. You'll put that biochar into a bucket and you'll pee on it. You'll pee on it until it smells like pee, which takes a long time, honestly. Um, and I know it sounds kind of strange and maybe it doesn't sound strange to you. You're showing up for a soil workshop, so maybe you don't feel that way, but um, urine is really filled with a lot of life, especially if you are a healthy person, which I assume many of you are showing up for a Heal the Planet. You're probably eating a very rich diet. So that's one way that we can close the loop. You can also just pee outside as well too, like pee on your bananas or um, pee next to a plant that needs some fertility and life. And that's gonna provide some significant nutrition to the system. Uh, and vermiculture. So vermiculture is composting with worms. On the left is a large scale vermicomposting system from that side on the big island. And on the right, this is my little worm bin underneath my nursery. So I'm thinking since we're running out of time that it seems like we need to do a full on composting workshop and I'm all for that. So we'll go into the details on how to create a worm bin um, and how to use worms, but essentially why we would, I have both systems on my site, both a compost pile and a vermicompost pile. And um, the reason I have both is because vermicomposting is a, a significant dose of nutrition. If you buy worm castings at the store, they call it black gold because it's so nutrient dense. It's kind of like super compost. Yalla. All right, gang, I'm back. Can you see me again? Yes, I can't see anybody. <laughs> Yes, I see Rick. Rick, can you see me? Good. All right, everybody. So we got four minutes left, but if you have more questions than that, that's totally cool. Um, but yeah, most of all, I am grateful for you guys showing up for soil because soil is something that is not looked at, something that is not really appreciated, but many of the challenges we're facing at this time will be remediated through focusing on that foundation of the soil. Um, so yeah, I hope you learned some techniques tonight that will help support you in this process. If you have any questions on it after this, I'm gonna type in my email. Megan. Yes, Noelia. The, before we go, um, I wanna remind everyone that you can register for our upcoming Heal the Planet Day. Megan posted in the chat the link to register and you're gonna have a chance to win $150 or $250 on a raffle. And also, um, Megan is gonna post now a link to a survey that you, if you have a moment, it's gonna take you probably three, four, three to five minutes to complete and that will be very helpful for Heal the Planet. Remember, we are a nonprofit and we really appreciate any feedback. And obviously, if you wanna join us, it's a free event on April the 25th. Thank you everyone for joining Megan. And Megan, thank you for shining again. Thank you, Noelia. Yeah, so I posted the link to the survey. We would love some feedback from you guys because really, we're doing this for you guys. Um, like Noelia said, we're a nonprofit and we're just trying to sp spread the word on ways that we can heal our relationship with the planet. And the soil is a great foundation for doing that. So um, I posted the link for the survey. We would love your feedback. Um, I'm not sure if one of the questions is about like what to interested in future workshops, but we can post that on our social media as well too. That was how we came up with some of these workshops here. But I also, I see we have some questions from before, so I'm gonna answer them. Um, will the slides be emailed after? Yes, if send me an email and I will happily send this little slideshow to you. Christina said, weeds are plants too. It's all about perspective. I think that would be a great topic. Thank you, Christine. I love to hear it. A great source in the meantime for learning about weeds is eattheweeds.com. 
um, killer source of learning about weeds, um, weeds for your place. Uh, Karina, is there any mulch you'd avoid because of disease or pest potentially being transported in? So yes, I saw this question earlier and that is an excellent question and one that I will often get when I'm speaking about mulch in the community. Um, and the truth is, is you're always running a gamble. But the truth is as well too, is that if you create this good relationship with tree trimmers, they, they want to help you. They don't wanna to have to pay to drop this stuff off and they have good hearts. They're good people as well too. And another reality as well too, is that if we're buying mulch from the store, um, that could be diseased plant matter as well too. And a lot of times that mulch is dyed as well too, like that brown mat mulch, black mulch, red mulch, um, they're adding in dyes as well too. So it's a, it's a risk that I'm willing to take. And I've had mulch dropped on sites all across the city in my own home as well too. And I've never had any issues. And even if there were some sort of disease plant matter in the equation, um, having that healthy system, it's like, we're gonna be exposed to germs and bacteria as well too. But if we have a healthy, strong system, we're able to say, no big deal, I can remediate that. And the soil can do the same thing. So focusing on building healthy life in the soil makes it so you don't have so much fear around that. But that is definitely a valid question and something to consider and something to express to the tree trimmer as well too. Just be like, hey, I, I don't wanna have any diseased plants. I, I'm not looking for any palm either. And a lot of them really stand true. Like they will wait until they have a gorgeous load to drop for you. Like even if it has a couple palms in it, I'm like, just drop it. But um, they're, they're good guys or gals. So just create that relationship. And I, I can't recommend it enough. And I can also recommend, since you're local, I could recommend some good sources around us. Um, the Wiley I wrote about our composting series. I can link to that in the chat if you all are interested. Did. Can the cardboard mulch compost mulch layers be put down in the same day or should there be a lag of timing all in the same day? So those photos that you saw, um, Garrett, was all just me in the same day. Um, and as I mentioned, the system will be the weakest when you first set it up. So it's going to be like, whoa, there's a lot of mulch, what's going on? But year after year, month after month, like as we move into the rainy season, you're going to notice that mulch breaking down. You're going to start having some really nice soil. But as I mentioned, the first thing that we're going to do is it's essentially like a potted plant in it. So you'll create a hole, fill it with your compost or topsoil, put your starter into that. And then it has the nice mulch around it that it can move out into, but it has that fertility right around it. So it's not trying to put out its roots directly into mulch. I have a couple questions, if I may. Yes, would love to hear it. Rick, what's up? I wrote two in the chat. Uh, can you tell us the name of that peanut you mentioned and also the pepper that you have in your yard that I took? I planted those seeds, the Florida pepper. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, so the name of the grass is perennial peanut grass. I'm typing it in the chat. And the name of the pepper, I actually got a text today from Maria, who was also at the garden tour and she texted me a picture of the pepper and she says, what's the name of this pepper? So it's called the Daddle Pepper, D-A-T-I-L. It's also known as the Florida Pepper. Um, and I'm actually using mine tonight uh, to make some fire cider. Um, yeah. Do you have any other questions? I did, but I forgot it. <laughs> all right, well, we got another chat, uh, another question in the chat. Are any and all food scraps good for compost? Yes, Christina. So. Any and all food scraps are good for compost. There's a big debate around whether to put bones in and things like that. Um, a lot of people think based off of just who I am, they're like, she's probably a vegan, but the truth is I'm not a vegan. I eat meat in moderation and um, I eat fish as well, like local fish and fish bones are something that you'll find at a garden store. So, um, all you got to do is just give it a little extra of that brown matter and I've had no issues with it at all. Um, but it depends if you have a big family and you're eating a lot of animal matter, that's something to consider. Um, but also the compost pile will signal you as well too. So like 
Um, you go out to the compost pile and it seems like it's not breaking down very well. It's just noticing. The first permaculture principle is observe and interact. So taking those cues, adding more brown matter, holding off on cooked food for a while. Um, but for the most part, you're really good. There's this guy, he calls himself the survival gardener and he's like, composting can be as simple as like throwing food on the ground. But I think it's nice to cover it up too. So don't worry about it and divert those food scraps from the landfill. Megan, I, I remember my other question was fish actually. I'm a fisherman. So carcasses, bones and, and heads and all, can that go in the, in the compost pile? Absolutely. That's great that you're a fisherman, Rick. I would love to connect with you and your fish. Okay, you can come out and catch your own with me if you want. I would love that. Actually, when I was 10 years old, I caught a world record tarpon, but we can talk more about that another day. I was a little tiny fisherman when I was growing up. I don't necessarily have the guts for it anymore. I try to, but <laughs> I think that that's a good way to uh, tap into the local food system, you know, to gain that energy and also cycle those nutrients back in. Okay. So yes, yeah, so you, can, you can definitely do that. Just make sure it's nice and covered up with your brown matter. Okay, and I have to leave. Thank you very much. Later, Rick. I want to, but thanks, guys. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, I'm going to write my name. Am I going to heal the planet? Awesome, thank you. Good question, Rick. My brother gives me tons of local fish he catches now. I'll cover the bones in my pile. I love to hear that, Christina. So here's my email. If you're on social media, you can follow me at Tropical Commons on Instagram. I have been trying to be, I've been more active this last year with um, informative videos. Like I sent one today of Instagram of my mulch pile. So you get to see my present mulch pile. Um, and then you can follow Heal the Planet on Facebook or on Instagram. Our name on Instagram is Heal the Planet. And I'm so grateful for you guys being here. Our next talk is going to be our next, our last winter workshop is going to be, um, I'm the last person on earth who uses a planner. <laughs> I don't know where my planner is right now. Um, but it will be the third Wednesday of the month, again, next month, and it's gonna be on food forests. So since it will hopefully be a little lighter then, we'll start the, the tour, the video with a little um, blurb from my food forest garden, and we'll talk about food forests and how to create a food forest system, which is my preferred way of growing. A lot of times when we think about growing food, we think of boxes and rows and things like that. Um, but the food forest system is especially useful in the urban environment because you're able to stack and use layers to maximize a small space. You can create a lot of biodiversity. And if you follow that Instagram page as well too, my page Tropical Commons, you'll see today I posted a picture of the food forest floor and I just labeled a couple of things that I saw around because it was just so beautiful to see so much diversity. Um, yeah, so it'll be the Food Forest, third Wednesday of March. And we'll be posting that on our social media on Heal the Planets page. And I'm gonna post one more time the link to the survey that we would love to hear from you all on. Thanks, Karina. Thanks so much for being here. Here's the link to the survey and I'll post one more time the link for the Heal the Planet Earth Day event. The event is on April 25th, as Noelia said. It's our sixth annual and you can win up to $250 if you register for at that link right there. That's the second link for the event, right? So that's all for now, dear friends. Um, thanks for being here. And I'll, I'll stay here for a minute or two longer if anybody has any more questions. But if not, we'll see you for the next workshop in March. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>